Welcome to Voices from the Street, the radio ministry of the Sacramento Union Gospel Mission. Prepare your heart for laughter and tears as we share the unpolished stories of the homeless and hurting, hope and transformation. Here is your host, director of the Union Gospel Mission, Pastor Tim Lane. Well, I would like to thank every single one of you for joining us today. I know you have a lot of things to do, and if you're driving along or you're in your house and you have tuned in and wonder what we're going to talk about today, that's what we always wonder, too. (laughs) But I have with me one of my newer employees. Uh, He's not just an employee, though. Uh, The people that work at the mission become They become friends and they become family. And and when I hired Jeremy, uh, Jeremy's been with us now about five months. We're sneaking up on six. So, (laughs) and I had him on originally, but I wanted to bring him back and I wanted him to share with you his perspective that is now that he's not brand new at the mission, it's not the first day, week, or month that he's had a time to acclimate to what the mission is all about. Jeremy uh, is an enthusiastic, he's a well-trained individual, but the most important thing is, you know, you can teach things. You cannot teach heart. Uh, You can't, when somebody goes to seminary, They can learn the biblical perspective, the eschatology. They can do all those things, but what they can't do is nobody can give them the heart of ministry except in God himself. And so along with his formal training has been his years that, that he has seen the destruction that drugs and alcohol can do. And so, uh, I would like to introduce to you Jeremy, and I would give you his last name, but it's French, and I can never pronounce it correctly. (laughs) So, Jeremy, uh, you want to tell the people just a brief backup to, you know, what, first of all, what gave you the heart for ministry to the homeless? That's not an easy Mm -hmm. gig. Yeah. Thanks, Pastor Lane, for kind words. Uh, Let's see. Well, what gave... I, I. you know, just a general uh, um, statement. I guess God gave me the heart. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I was in a situation like the people I'm ministering to now at at, at the point of uh, when the Lord uh, um, worked on my heart and saved me, and I just got to giving back in the community of the homeless uh, where I was at when He saved me. Um, it, it's a experience that they're all going through that I'm familiar with. Uh, the Lord comforts us in, in our times and trials uh, so that we can comfort people with um, uh, any, uh, with, with comfort they need, with, with the comfort we are shown by God with, uh, 2 Corinthians tells us. Um, but that's any type of comfort. But the uniqueness is... Um, I've seen the gospel applied in my own life in the same circumstances and experiences these guys are going through. And so it's really just paying forward what the Lord's shown me in, in these same circumstances they're going through. Uh, I, I just, um, ever since I was saved, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I, I love this environment. I love these guys. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, uh, when these guys have just uh, experienced the depths of the the effects of sin in their life and how far they've fallen to see uh, Christ glorified through the gospel being applied to their lives is such an amazing thing to see. And that's the extra, extra treat involved. Yeah, you can be absolutely theologically correct and not have the heart to minister to people. You can you know, the Bible tells us that if you speak with the tongues of men and angels, but you have not love, what are you? You're nothing more than a sounding gong in the desert. And so when you come to ministry, as I said and, and alluded to earlier, you can have all the, the training that you need, but that is, that is the orthodox look at things. But the other thing is the orthopraxy or the practice of those things that are orthodox. The Bible tells us the kind word turneth away much wrath. And so we would say to ourselves, okay, but that's 
talking about volatile situations? Well, I don't think so. I think that it's also talking about the way we approach people and what our tenor and what our tone is. And you can tell somebody the same thing with a harsh and a, an unforgiving spirit, and you can say the exact same words with a kind and a loving heart that's guided by God and make a total different impression on the on the hearer. Correct, Jeremy? Mm, yeah, amen, for sure. I think these guys listen mm-hmm. uh, when they know they're loved. Uh, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. That's right. It's kind of a cheesy saying, but... um, No, but it's a true saying. Right. Yeah, these guys will listen to you if you come at them uh, like like you really care, like you really love them, and, and, and they know that. You know, sometimes in ministry, especially where we are, what makes one of the biggest impacts is not how brilliant you come across to people, but again, it's that caring thing. It's that arm around the shoulder. It's that I'm in this battle with you, that I want to help you in whatever way possible. It's not just my job to do this. It's that I truly care about you. Mm. And you've seen that played out since you've been here in the last six months, have you not? Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, Being a seasoned veteran now of five months at the mission. Uh, <laughs> five and a half. Yeah, it's, I've developed relationships with these guys that uh, my first month or so, they probably wouldn't have listened or right. heard, uh, really leaned into what I had to say uh, initially as they do now. Now they chase me down. Now they come into my office like a revolving door um, with problems and, and seeking advice and prayer. And so... Uh, yeah, that relationship that develops over time uh, definitely gives an open ear. And is that not exactly the definition of what a chaplain needs to be? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you are the representative to them of our God. And what you rep- the way you represent God will reflect how they start to see the Heavenly Father as well. Mm. And I don't mean, because we're all flawed individuals, but what I mean is when a person is harsh and uncaring and unkind and still claims the name of Christ and says that I'm the pastor or I'm the chaplain, and yet they they don't have that love there. The, the guys can feel that. They know that. And, you know, they have a saying on the street, this person or that person is the real deal. And what they're looking for is authenticity in their lives. And as chaplains and pastors at the Union Gospel Mission, we have to be the real deal. They have to know that it is really our heart and not just our job. Is that not correct, Jeremy? Yeah, amen. You used the word the other day at work, uh, under-shepherd. Yeah, That's really, I love the name. It's really what we are. We're, we're under-shepherds of our chief shepherd, Jesus. Amen. And so uh, we're walking like he walked and trying to talk like he talks, and mm-hmm. we're really just showing them our humility before our, our Lord and Savior to them as we are humble before them. And uh, so it we're... Uh, we're reconciled reconcilers. We're uh, we're, we're right. saved people who are seeking to see people saved. We are uh, first and foremost sheep, and, and uh, we're doing some shepherding things. So um, we're modeling Christ, and we're modeling the life we're encouraging these guys to to buy into. Yeah, and so nobody that works at the mission can work there if it's just a job. Correct. Right. Did you come just because you needed a job? No, I was... You were already I, working yeah, to begin I, with, right? I had a job, yeah. Uh, but it, it's a... Like I said, it's a platform to see much made of Jesus in the lives of people who are so desperately in need for him. And it's an opportunity to to walk and talk the gospel that these guys really need. You know... When you are talking about many of the people who are drug and alcohol dependent people, there are huge problems with trying to approach people that are on drugs, alcohol, and in that kind of depth of addiction, correct? Mm -hmm. There's also great opportunities to people who are in the depth of of, uh, 
depravity, correct? Life, yeah, situation. Mm -hmm. So what would you say offhand is one of the hardest things to penetrate through to a person who's on, who's been doing drugs and alcohol not for six months or two years, but maybe for five or 10 or even 20 years or more? Yeah. Um, I think of a C.S. Lewis quote I just read that when, uh, when Jesus comes into our heart, when we're born again, he doesn't come to just uh, remodel the house. That's he, right. He tears it down and rebuilds the entire thing and lives in you. And uh, so these guys need to be ready for a whole new way of uh, looking at life. Uh, um, John Calvin said he doesn't know what comes first, uh, knowledge of God or an understanding of who you are as a person. So um, you understand who you are through your knowledge of who God is. Uh, so to rightly understand who you are, you need to rightly ha have a good view of who God is. That's right. Um, so what happens first, nobody knows, but they both kind of happen at the same time. You know that you're created, you're not God. <laughs> you know that you're dependent on a creator to exist. And so your whole life takes a different trajectory. And uh, not to freak guys out in the middle or in the beginning, but um, they're going to need... It's, there's a reason Jesus says you need to be born again. You, you need to become a newborn baby at whatever age you're at, learning how to live life in a completely different way. And uh, that's the joy we get to do with these guys is walk them, hold their hand into life with a whole new heart and a whole new worldview and a whole new way of, uh, a whole new set of values and, and, and wants and desires. And um, it, it's worth it <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um but how yeah. I would approach the person that needs it in that in that dark uh, circumstance in their life, um, uh, I I just be I I let them know or we're gonna we'll do this together. If you want to go in that direction, we'll we'll go there together. Yeah, exactly. It's not, you know, we use the term metaphor, and being born again is not just a metaphor; it's a reality, and so that real second birth that takes place. You know, I baptized uh, a young man who is, well, he wasn't a young man then. He was a, he was still a child. He's a strong, handsome, grown man now who loves the Lord. And when I baptized him, he was in tears and his mom asked him, well, <laughs> what what's wrong? And he said, well, the pastor told me that I I would be entering into a new life. And he said, because he was a baseball player and all those things, he said, and I kind of like my old life. Yeah. But he wanted the new life more than he wanted the old life. And mm -hmm. even though he was a child and coming in a, a childish manner, it was a real deal. And he has proven every day of his life since then. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there can be some fear, right, about... Yeah. I'm leaving my old life behind. What does that look like? I'm going into the unknown, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And um, we, we uh, that's one of the unique um, experiences you get to walk with people through. Uh, I was telling somebody yesterday, it was just a good reminder to see somebody who is really hardened from life. It's been a lot of time in prison, yep. uh, but he was... a I believe he's working off a new set of faculties. He's born again. So Yeah, uh, he had the knowledge. Right. But now he needs to to walk the walk, right? Yeah. So we're taking him to just do those normal everyday life things like uh get a primary care physician, um, uh go out in public and go into a store and, and get medication. Um uh just those normal things, go into a coffee shop mm -hmm. and, and it's terrifying to them. Uh, because they've only known one way of doing those things. And now as a Christian, you're applying the gospel to those very normal, everyday things, which is, uh, which is the, those uh, scary moments when people either uh, say, let's go ahead by faith, or they say, this isn't for me. I'm, I'd rather do my old life. I was pretty good at that. <laughs> well, and, you know, y you talk about fear, 
And I think that we fail to understand sometimes that the people that we are dealing with, that, yeah, they could face a knife, a fight in the street, mm -hmm. prison. They're rough. They're tough sometimes. They are streetwise. And we say, well, they're not afraid. Well, that's not true at all. Right. Yeah. And that's what you see. Um, it's really, really fascinating uh, to see uh, just the, the obvious outward symptoms of the, how terrified they are as they just go into a public setting for the first time as a Christian um, after uh, surviving for years another way. And uh, it, it's a unique experience. Yeah, we, uh, we during the summertime particularly, we will, uh, I will have the chaplains uh, take the guys to a baseball game or to the fair or to one other, some other normal event. And you say to yourself, I don't really see how that is part of recovery. Why are you spending money on, on that kind of stuff? Well, first of all, I have a wonderful board of directors that often donates money to the missions. They, they donate in other times, but this is on our board meeting night, and it's specifically intended for us to use, you know, to do things like that. But regardless of that, the benefit is is huge because you, you may have been to a ball game in your life, clean and sober, but many of our guys have never done anything clean and sober. Mm. And it's the first time maybe that they've ever been to a ball game, ever been to the fair, and certainly the first time in years and years that they would be not doing drugs or alcohol, right? Yeah. And so what kind of a benefit could that be to them? Um, just getting time. Uh, just getting time in life. Uh, and it's more than just being clean and sober. It's, yep. it's, uh, it, it, it's um, reapproaching uh, your family again. Mm -hmm. It's um, having the first job as a Christian, mm -hmm. uh, having a new uh, valuing money differently, mm -hmm. um, being a steward of your body and life and, and watching your words and seeking to please Jesus and um, every environment you walk into. And uh, there's always that first time you walk into a new environment with those motives and purpose and um, aim of yours. And um, and the more you get those under your belt, the more you know you can do the the next one, and 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 um, it, it's just an experience thing. It's a new life. Well, I saw you do something the other day. You and I were kneeling down by the fence to talk to a man that was out there on the sidewalk, and uh, just so you know, uh, it didn't appear we had much of an impact on him, <laughs> but. Uh, Jeremy, uh, it was starting to sprinkle, and he was saying he was out of the hospital, and he was getting wet. He didn't have anything, and so we were going to go get him a jacket, and I couldn't find one. We didn't have one back there, so Jeremy gave him his jacket, and uh, he's a chaplain. He's a man who's followed Christ, and we can see that played out in the life of a believer, but I've seen that with our guys, too where they will have a jacket that they care about mm -hmm. and somebody out on the street doesn't. What does that say about a person who is always used to taking and now has come to a point where they they start wanting to give? Yeah, that's a great sign. It's a response of gratitude for what you believe you've been given in your salvation. Um uh, what do we have that we did not receive? Uh, That's right. <laughs> what, uh, what I mean. That's what the Bible tells us. <laughs> right. And uh, you see somebody in need. I think some of these guys just have never been in a position to where um, every effort, penny, and thing of value of theirs wasn't aimed at and directed towards uh, something they were serving their idol with. Um, uh um, supporting their addiction or something yeah. like that, and so now they don't have that addiction, and and, um, and or or the 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 sand pit that they're pouring money into, and so now they have things to give. They really see that they don't really need that much, and um, and they're grateful. So it's a good, great symptom 
uh, for sure. Yeah, because if you spend a lifetime watching out for yourself, making sure you have, making sure that you hoard away whatever it is that you do have, it's an amazing thing to be freed from that kind of a, a mindset. And, you know, uh, let me, you said something. You said freed from their idols. And, of course, the average middle-class person out in suburbia, uh, we don't think we have idols, right? We're not <laughs> on drugs or alcohol. And Are there other kinds of idols that people can fall into with maybe not even realizing it? Sure. I think everyone battles with themselves mostly. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, just the, the normal Christian life is, is always uh, fighting the exalting of self above God and Christ in their life. And, um, and really, that's what the addict does, is just uh, serves themselves uh, through pleasure-seeking. And, um, and so, really, I, I, you know, even when good things, I'm really just uh, taken back by how many good things can become God things. Things that God put on our heart to desire, like mm-hmm. uh, comfort, mm-hmm. uh, which we're supposed to receive from him, but we can make that a must-have, and uh, so we can organize and structure our lives to be uh, comfortable. and Build a little kingdom of our own. Right, yeah, and, and to avoid pain and, and, and to just cruise through life. And so you can, you know, you just... Uh, good things can become God things all the time, and you can find yourself living for yourself. And he means inappropriate God things, not our God things, but little g God things. Right. They can be, become the idols of our life. Here's a surprise for you. Uh, religion can be an idol. Hmm. A church can be an idol. Your wife or your husband can become an idol. Uh, it depends on the priority that you put in your life. Are you supposed to love your wife or your husband? Absolutely. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly, men, love your wives the way that Christ loved the church. Being willing to lay down his life, and life on a, you know, that life laid down on the cross. And so we know that that's a high priority and you need to love your kids. But when you put anything, including your wife and your family, above God, you have made an idol out of it. Mm. And when that becomes more important than what God wants you to do, you've made an idol out of it. Right. And so your business, is it good to work? Yes, it's good to work. Is it good to save money? Yes, save money. But that money can easily turn to be your God. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to be addicted to, to drugs or alcohol to be addicted to life itself. Right. And so um, we're almost out of time, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you had one takeaway, uh, you, we got just one minute. Okay. So uh, what would you say to the people out there uh, about the mission? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a praise the Lord for a mission in the middle of a area where we're at, um, where the gospel can go out every single night, where guys can choose to uh, um, be in a residential program where they're cared for and shepherded and, and loved on. And and uh, um, uh, just keep us in your prayers if you could. Mm-hmm. And uh, we hope to see you there. Yes, and as always, my dear friends, until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Listening to Voices from the Street, the radio ministry of the Sacramento Union Gospel Mission. If your heart's been touched and you want to know more about the work of the mission, log on to UGMSAC.com, UGMSAC.com. To donate clothing, food, time, or financial help, call 916 447 3268. 916 447 3268. Thank you so much for listening. Join us again next week at the same time for Voices from the Street.